date setting and distortions, an explanation of how the sensationalism of date setting leads to reproach on God's word, and why there's no way to set the date for the conclusion of the current dispensation. Um, let me reset this. Okay, I guess it is going. Okay. All right, so um, why, how do we know that there's no way that the date for the conclusion of, of this dispensation of grace can, can be set? I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 51. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, the Word of God says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He says, I show you a mystery. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So Paul says that it's a mystery, and it's part of the revelation of the mystery that we receive from the Apostle Paul uh, that's recorded in Romans through Philemon about this dispensation of grace that we know that the church, the body of Christ, not the subject of prophecy, at the conclusion of this dispensation, we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. And I'll refer to that as the rapture. I know that's not a biblical word, but it's a convenient word and a great word uh, that we can use to describe the Lord coming down, not all the way down to the earth as he will at the second coming, but in the clouds, he will catch up the body of Christ. We'll be caught up to be with the Lord and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the, the prophecy as an event is part of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation the mystery. It's not part of the prophetic program as revealed by the mouth of all God's holy prophets since the world began. So we cannot look to a prophetic sign or event to, to prepare or to, to indicate that the rapture is going to happen or it's imminent, as we say. It could happen at any moment, at any day. Uh, so uh, we can't do that. So if, if we were to be standing on earth and experience a prophetic event that God told Israel would happen outside of the revelation given to us through Paul, what do we know for certain? You miss the rapture. <laughs> and, and, and if you miss the rapture, what do you know about your spiritual condition? You're lost. You're not saved. So the way to prepare for the rapture is to what? Get saved. To know you're, sh you're saved is going to be the assurance and the comfort uh, that's going to come that, that will keep you from being caught up in the sensationalism of date setting for the rapture. You know, I know when, when in, in the past, you know, through the years, we, we've all known over and over in our lifetime, we've heard of dates being set for the rapture. And although it would be wonderful if the rapture had happened when those dates were set, I mean, we'd be in a much better condition than we are now, uh, that would have been wonderful. But, you know, there, there was, at certain points in my spiritual growth, there, there was some, you know, um, lack of confidence. And so with the with being established as believers, we learned that there's, there's just no prophetic signs and events that can be used to, to predict the rapture. Um, and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and, and we're going to look at verse 4. First Timothy 2 verse 4. The Bible says, uh, verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So God's will for us today, or for the world today, in the dispensation of grace, 
is that all men be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Best preparation for the rapture is to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So how do we know for sure that we won't miss the rapture? We need to trust that Christ died for our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 tell us, Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we need to trust that when Christ died on the cross, he died to pay for our sins. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when we trust the, the gospel that Christ died for our sins, what happens to that believer the moment they trust that Christ died for their sins? They're sealed, aren't they? So we know that because we have a verse, Ephesians 1.13. Um, the best thing to do is memorize these verses, commit them to memory, because whenever we wake up, as, as the brother said this week, they don't always feel saved. Uh, so we have verses to renew our minds and, and to give ourselves assurance that we're saved. Uh, verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 1 says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The redemption of the purchased possession. The, the last installment, if you will, for our salvation is to have our physical body changed uh, to receive that immortal glorified body uh, a body that will live forever in eternity for God's purpose that he saved us unto, as we've heard a, a lot about this week. So the moment we trust the gospel, the operation of God is to place that believer in Christ. Uh, we know the, the passages, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. But when we're sealed, uh, we're sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 30, confirms that for us also. Uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, the redemption of our body. So we, we have this confidence that when we trusted the gospel, God Almighty identified us together with the Lord Jesus Christ, He's placed us in Christ. Our spiritual, our spirit, dead spirit was regenerated, made alive by the indwelling of, of God's Holy Spirit in us and the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirit is resurrected the moment we trust the gospel with Christ. And now we're able to, uh, uh, we are sealed unto that day of redemption the moment we trust the gospel. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, um, we're told several things. It's a, chapter 1 of Ephesians 3 through 7 is like an inventory of some of the things God has made us in Christ from the, the doctrine that is given to us and laid down in the book of Romans. So this is a great way to review uh, who and what God's made you in Christ by coming to this chapter, and I, I know a lot of you Go to this for devotion and, and comfort and peace. Uh, but verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. These are things that we have by being identified together with Christ. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I had a gentleman mention to me uh, uh, in one of the meetings that we aren't adopted. Only Israel has the adoption. Well, we are adopted in Christ. Christ is God's son. We're accepted in him. And in Christ, uh, we're, when God sees us, he sees Christ's perfect righteousness, and God can say of us, 
uh, that he's well pleased with us because of who we are and who we've been made in Christ. So in Christ, we, we have the adoption. Uh, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So the moment we trust the gospel, God places us in Christ. God the Holy Spirit seals us there, and in Christ we have the forgiveness of sins. What's the only thing that keeps someone, a man, a sinner, a son of Adam from having eternal life? Sin. The wages of sin is death. Um, the moment we trust the gospel, God regenerates our dead spirit. We have the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Uh, there's no need to confess our sins af after that point, but we can pray and be thankful that God has forgiven us of our sins, can't we? So in Christ, our sins are forgiven. And uh, Colossians chapter 2 uh, tells us he's forgiven us all trespasses. So will you miss the rapture if you've trusted in Christ? We, we know there's no possible way we could, that could happen for a believer. Uh, and um, there, uh, since uh, there's a lot of confusion and distortions, um, as, as uh, Richard said a moment ago as well, um, today, and, and most of the confusion revolves around not, re, not rightly dividing the word of truth, doesn't it? And uh, I'm sure if you grew up in a denominational system, there was, uh, the, there was uh, teaching that, that you probably heard from the book of Matthew and 24 and other passages and, uh, that told you that, um, that confused the, the events of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with the events of the rapture. And uh, there was a movie, uh, I Wish We'd All Been Re Ready, that, that was real popular back in the 80s and 70s, late 70s. And in that movie, uh, there was a song that went along with it, Two Men Are Walking Up a Hill, One Man's Gone, and One's Left Standing Still, I Wish We'd All Been Ready, as though the one taken was taken in the rapture. And so, but then you find out after studying, the one taken is taken in judgment. It's the opposite, right? So the confusion comes with confusing those two events, the events of the second coming and the events of the rapture. Um, so that's, that's, again, God would have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. The moment we trust the gospel, we need to be established. We need to be established in the doctrines that give us a, a, a surety and, and give us assurance and security and in what and who and what God has made us in Christ, and to understand our program and what and to understand again, first of all, there's no prophetic event that will precede the rapture. Since the first century A.D., when the Word of God was completed, um, there have been, according to Wikipedia, um, 170 religious sources have set dates for the rapture. Now, the first thing about 170 sources setting, religious sources setting these dates, is we know that there have been far more than that because these are the ones that are recorded in history. How about every little fellowship and every group that they had, you know, that, that didn't make it into the, into the books of history? So we know that this has been a common occurrence by the confusion, again, of mixing the events of the second coming, the prophetic program, with the, with, uh, the dispensation of grace. So. Of those, among those, some of the more historic date setters, the Millerites uh, predicted the return on October 22nd, uh, 1844. And they, uh, the Millerites sold their properties and worldly goods. And, and after their great disappointment, they eventually became the Seventh-day Adventists. So a lot of, you know, there are several times when these groups, a leader would rise up, they'd rally around this leader and, and believe be convinced by him, these events of the prophetic program, the signs in the world are fulfilling those, those events and those signs for Israel. And uh, being misled, they form a, uh, a cult or a, a denomination. Uh, another example is uh, when Charles Russell told his followers to expect the Lord to return. Uh, at, and uh, the resurrection of the dead would happen in 1878. And when that date didn't come, he reset it for 1914. And they became the Jehovah Witnesses. So another cult comes out of this same uh, distortion and confusion and uh, reproach on the Word of God, 
when you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're confused, and then you, you end up falling into these kind of traps. Uh, Florence Haltiff, considered a prophetess by the Branch Davidians, predicted April 22, 1959 as the rollout date of the Revelation's tribulation period. Wrong. And her group splintered in the aftermath. One of those splinter groups was led by David Koresh in Waco, Texas. So you can see a lot of harm comes out of, of this teaching. Not only people selling all their, their worldly possessions and goods to be disappointed, but the, oh, the constant occurrence of setting dates and the disappointment has brought the world to a place where they're scoffers, aren't they? And whenever a date's set, people, oh, you know, there's those foolish Christians. And that's the reproach that's brought on the body of Christ, on the Word of God, uh, because of not rightly dividing the Word of truth. Um, so the most recent uh, re forecast of, of the second coming of the Lord and the judgment and wrath is tomorrow, July 27th. <laughs> there's going to be a total lo lunar eclipse, and when that happens, there's going to be a blood moon. And the Bible talks about a blood moon, doesn't it? Right? Um, we know it does. Uh, Joel chapter 231 and Acts 220 uh, is a quote from Joel 31. And so, you know, just, just to let you know, it's going to be we're not going to be able to see that blood moon because it's only going to be viewed from the other side of the world. And when there is a total lunar eclipse, what happens? Uh, the earth gets between the sun and the moon, and so there's a, it, the sun blocks, it's like an eclipse, again, a lunar eclipse, total eclipse of the moon. Uh, the light that comes around the earth, it, it filters out some of the blue and other light colors and only the, the red and the, and the uh, amber shades are cast on the moon, and it's, it's pretty, it's great to witness any, you know, uh, um, uh, how would you say, event in the heavens where God created these things, and we get to see them, but you know, lunar eclipses happen twice a year. It's, it's not that uncommon, and uh, you know, what, what happens, uh, turn with me, if, if you would, to Acts chapter 2 now. Uh, we're going to read Joel's prophecy again, and it's been read several times already this week, but uh, Acts chapter 2, I want you to see something. A lunar eclipse, they happen twice a year. Uh, what what's really gets them excited is when there are four lunar eclipses that happen in a row on the Jewish feast days. And uh, that's, that's only happened uh, 10 times since the first century AD, just 10 times. But what gets some religious folk excited about that is they say that a major Jewish event is going to happen when that occurs. And uh, they cite, you know, that they really have to reach to find something that correlated in history that happened on that date. And uh, one of those, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, which some Jews were persecuted definitely in that, and that was awful. Uh, when in 1948, when uh, the nation of Israel was, was reborn, right? Was that, you know, that event, 1948, that wasn't fulfillment of scripture. That, that wasn't something God did. That's, that's something a bunch of men did. And, uh, but they, of course, they claim that, and a lot of, again, religious folk believe that now we can start setting dates and times based on the, the rebirth of, of the nation of Israel. And another, uh, the Six Day War occurred when this happened. So, so those are the events you know, that have happened that get religious people all excited when there are four blood moons that happened during Jewish feast days. But again, look at Acts chapter 2. We shouldn't let any uh, signs in the heavens get us uh, excited about the end of, of this dispensation of grace. Again, it's, it's the revelation of the mystery that we know about the rapture. It's, there's no prophetic events associated with it. Verse 17 of, of Acts 2, quote from Joel, the prophet Joel, and it came to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So, the sun's going to be turned to darkness 
on this side of the earth, the side that's facing the sun, and the moon's going to be turned to blood on that side of the earth that's nighttime, away from the sun. So those two events can't happen at the same time. If, this, if there's a solar eclipse, the sun's light is blocked completely. No light is going to reach the moon to turn it red. Okay, So that doesn't happen. A solar eclipses and lunar eclipses cannot happen at the same time. That's definitely something God is doing. It makes you wonder, well, how can those happen at the same time? Well, maybe a heavenly body you know, could cover the moon. Maybe New Jerusalem, something else is covering the light from the sun to make those things happen. I don't know. But God can make it happen, can he? And didn't God uh, cause the sun to stand still in Joshua uh, 10, verse 13, for a full day? So Joshua can had, had more time to whip up on the Gibeonites. And, uh, and also with Hezekiah, he made the, the uh, sundial go back 10 degrees. You know, so God can do that. Well, you know, it's funny you read about that. What, what really happened? And this is, this is on Christian, you know, Blue Letter Bible. There was an article tagged onto there. Well, there would have been catastrophic events in, on the world if the sun would have actually gone backwards. So here's some possible other explanations of what happened. They just can't believe the word of God. And that, that can't, couldn't be that God had the power to do that, right? Not, not only did he create everything, but he couldn't, certainly couldn't make something change a little bit, right? So, you know, again, unbelief. They're not going to accept that by faith. Go with me to Titus chapter 2 now. So there shouldn't be, you know, there won't be any confusion about the prophetic signs, because there are going to be something that can't, you know, that are just impossible. God's going to make signs. There's going to be a light show uh, before the day of the Lord begins, according to the book of Revelation. There's going to be stars are going to fall from heaven. There's going to be, uh, in fact, I was going to have you, well, for time's sake, let's, let's go to the text, Titus 2.13. Uh, we're going to start reading um, in verse 1. No, let's, let's go to, go to two, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Paul over and over admonishes the body of Christ to live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's our text, verse 13. We're to look for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul writes to Titus, and he says to Titus, we're to look, himself included, for, the, for that blessed hope. Did Paul think the rapture could have happened in his day? When you read in his epistles, he, when he mentions the rapture, talks about it, it's, it could have happened in his day with his understanding of, of there was no prophetic event. He doesn't admonish Titus to look for a sign in the heaven before the great and before the blessed hope. You know, so there aren't any signs. Paul doesn't give us any, any verses to tell us or, or any instruction of any sign to precede the rapture. And, um, but in the same passage, if you go back to verse 1, Paul is, is commanding Titus to teach in verse 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Again, we're to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. When we're established in the doctrines, we have great confidence and reason. We're not to be caught up in the distortions and in the snares and traps that are to ensnare members of the body of Christ with promises of prophetic events and so forth that the day of Christ is at hand. So he says to Titus, speak the things which become sound doctrine to your church, that the aged men be sober, there's that word again, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, that the aged women likewise 
that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So we're admonished over and over to be sober, uh, to be of a sound mind, uh, to be established in the faith. That brings stability to all of our lives, doesn't it? Uh, in, uh, in 1995, I, I re-enrolled in Grace School of the Bible. And going through the class, the, the only curriculum that uses the Pauline design of edification to establish believers, young men to women to, to be able to have ministry, uh, in the doctrine given to the church, the body of Christ, to establish us today as believers, going through the process, the change, the, the mature, maturation process of, of growing spiritually to maturity, you could, you just... You realize that in all aspects of your life, if you ever have the opportunity to go through Grace School of Bible, I encourage you to do it. It's life-changing. Uh, it's, it's a benefit to somebody who plans to be in the ministry. I wasn't planning to be in the ministry when I went through Grace School of the Bible. Uh, I thought it was something I needed to do. I wanted to, to be established so I could teach Sunday school or what have you, you know. And the desire to preach came out of the class with with understanding the great message that we've been given to preach, uh, came the desire to, 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 you know, there's a lack of preachers today. So, you know, it's definitely, a, there's a need in the body of Christ for preachers. But I encourage anybody to go through it, if not, if for nothing else, just to be more confident, more, more grounded, uh, more mature, spiritually mature, so that you have an answer for all the doubts and fears that might come as a believer and questions from others. So I encourage anyone to go through Grace School of the Bible. But this to be sober-minded is something Paul admonishes over and over uh, in, his, in his epistles. <clears throat> so Paul definitely believed the rapture was imminent, could happen at any time. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 now. <coughs> And we're going to begin reading in verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, what? The hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. If we know one thing, multiple passages in the Word of God tell us, God has not appointed us unto wrath. The whole, a big part of understanding sound doctrine is you're members of the body of Christ, you're ambassadors for Christ. Anytime there's going to be war, what's the first thing a nation does that's declaring war on another nation? They pull out their ambassadors. You know, before... Uh, a bomb campaign is going to begin, you pull out the ambassadors. You're not, got, not going to bomb your ambassadors, right? And you know, di diplomacy is over at that point. No need for them to be in harm's way. Um, but God's going to take the church, the body of Christ, out before this, he brings judgment upon this world according to his prophetic purpose. So we have several promises in God's word that God is going to take the body of Christ out before the events, the prophetic events and signs of the prophetic program begin. So we're to <clears throat> be established in the Word of God. Uh, this helps us to, uh, to be aware of the spiritual traps and uh, so that when we know sound doctrine, we hear something that's foreign to sound doctrine that doesn't fit the, the, the doctrine as we've been taught. We can reject those things. Uh, not to be dis, uh, ensnared. We understand that Satan hates the revelation of the mystery. And we've heard about that a lot this week. Why it make, made him out to be the world's fool. Okay. 
a secret was hid from him, thinking no secret could be hid from him. It was. So Satan hates this message, and he's the father of all lies. So how is he going to try to confuse? Is it hard? Is it, it's, it's his M.O. to bring confusion and to question the word of God and bring doubt upon the word of God. So we need to be established so we have the confidence. We're not subject to those types of snares, conspiracy ideas, all these traps that are out there to take believers away from the message God's entrusted to us to preach and to get off on some other silly thing and be distracted and to bring reproach on the body of Christ. And Mike, you, you grew up <coughs> hearing the, the fable about uh, Chicken Little or, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, right? Well, you know, that's what it looks like when these dates are set and they, don't, they aren't fulfilled. It just bring, makes the body of Christ seem foolish, doesn't it? Crying wolf and so forth, the, the child's tales that are no, no doubt brought on by uh, those who preach the truth and warned about the wrath to come and so forth um, from, from faith standpoint. So we're not to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Um, go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 now, <clears throat> and verse 1. <clears throat> now the Spirit sp speaketh expressly that in the latter days, or excuse me, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. <clears throat> um, drop down to verse 13. But he admonishes the body of Christ, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly unto them, or to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continuing in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So the answer is be established in sound doctrine. Not only save yourself from the apostasy and the lies, the snares, the traps, and heresy, but save those that hear thee. We're, to, we're admonished to stay with the stuff. We're to be established in the word of God. Colossians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 6. Um, God will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Uh, chapter 2, again, of Colossians, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. We did that. How did we receive the Lord? We trusted that Christ died for our sins. <clears throat> We trusted in the verses that he's given for salvation today. So walk ye in him. We're to trust in the verses that he's given to the body of Christ today by, by rightly dividing the word of truth to understand our program. And we're to be established in that doctrine. Um, as we're to walk in him, in that doctrine, we're given to walk in, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tr tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Spoiled, it, it's the idea of like pirates that would capture a ship and spoil that ship. They, it, they would take all the, that, that was of value out of that ship. We're spoiled. All the, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Whenever we get snared and, and trapped and don't understand who we are as members of the body of Christ, we're spoiled. We're robbed of all the blessings we can access by faith. Uh, God's grace is sufficient for us to walk in uh, and give us confidence and, and uh, assure us of God's love for us and who and what he's made us in Christ. And whenever we, we are snared or, or, or we swerve away from this doctrine, we're spoiled. We, and, it's, and it's by philosophy. And, and philosophy is a big part of the problem today, isn't it? There was a young man, very sad, that he was, uh, he was, doing, he was preaching, and as a novice, he was, he was uh, uh, on Facebook, is, is how I know of him, and in groups and teaching and claiming to be a leader of the uh, of among men that, that preach the word rightly divided. And then the next thing you know, he puts out a video, he's become an atheist. And so, you know, but how does that happen? Well, he obviously was 
was getting caught up and reading everything available, every conspiracy idea, everything new out there, everything somebody had to present. He was studying and trying to get to know his enemy, I guess, and, or I don't know his reasoning and motivation, but the next thing you know, he's, he's swerved. Now he proclaims himself to be an atheist. So, you know, um, we, uh, but by the grace of God, there go I, right? I mean, we need to be careful. We don't need to be ignorant of the devices. We need to protect ourselves and those we love from those things happening. It could happen to anyone. So we need to guard ourselves and, and put on that armor and, and renew our minds daily. And, and we need to uh, um, avoid that. Um, so um, look in the same chapter. Well, no, I took you to Colossians. I want to, if you're in Second Thess, if you're in, yeah, turn with me to Second Thessalonians. Sorry. And also get First Thessalonians five eight. So Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians two and First Thessalonians five eight. <clears throat> We read this, so we don't need to read it again. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's read verse 16. We're to shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is already past, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, in Paul's day, there were those who were trying to uh, proclaim that the rapture had already passed. And so these things are definitely uh, happening today by those who are quoting scripture but not rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's scriptural but not dispensational. Um, I want you to see, uh, and we're, we're getting short on time here, so I'm going to ask you to uh, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Get to the end of my notes here. Matthew 24. Now, the prophetic program, there were signs given to the nation of Israel and uh, to, but the Lord was preparing the little flock in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to go through the tribulation period, wasn't he? Uh, John uh, asked the Pharisees, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So that whole program, the king was there to bring, ready to bring in his kingdom. The only thing uh, standing between Israel and, and the millennial or thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth with them uh, is the tribulation period. So the Lord, uh, the, the disciples uh, asked the Lord, when are, uh, verse 3, Matthew 24, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So don't let a war... How many people do you think thought World War II might have been an indication this was the end of the world. And there have been other great wars like that that would have discouraged anyone looking at a war as an indicator of the coming of the Lord. Uh, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Drop down to verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by David the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. We don't need to worry about a prophetic event. Uh, the event the Lord states that they're to know of a surety that this is the sign of his coming is the... Uh, the event that Paul tells us about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, right? About the, uh, 
um, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And again, why it was talked about this week. Uh, that, that is the sign that is indisputable. Not a war, not a earthquake, not a phenomena that happens in the earth. We can't look to those things as signs of the end, but those signs, again, in the book of Revelation that are indisputable, they're, they're, they're miracles of God that are happening in the heavens. Nothing like that has ever happened before. Those are going to be the signs of the prophetic program that they can look to and know surely that this is what God is doing when those events happen. But we know the, uh, uh, in the dispensation of grace, we don't need to worry about a prophetic sign because who are the signs for anyway? They're for the nation of Israel, aren't they? Uh, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2, we can look at the passage. Um, verse 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. <clears throat> For the Jews require a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. Sixty-seven times the word uh, signs appears in the Bible. And 63 of those 67 are outside of Paul's epistles. The three times the word sign appears in Paul's epistles, one is here, another is Romans 4 when Paul's talking about the sign of circumcision given to uh, Abraham for Israel. And the other time has to do with uh, tongues being a sign for not for believers, but for unbelievers, right? And that was when in Corinth, whenever that, that, that little assembly was, was established next door, joined hard to a synagogue, and they were, during that Acts period, um, as we heard about from Art Sims, uh, it, it had to do with uh, the provoking ministry that God had for the nation of Israel early in, in the Acts period when, Paul, when those signs were manifested by believers in Corinth. So it wasn't something that continues on today, but, in, but ended by the end of the book of Acts, and Paul tells us about that in, in the book of Corinthians. When the word of God is complete, those things will pass away. So signs are not for the body of Christ. They were for the nation of Israel. So these signs aren't, aren't for us. They, there's no sign for the end of this dispensation. A uh, day of the Lord prophesied event can't precede the rapture since we have verses that tell us that God saved us from the wrath to come. We looked at one already uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, I'd like you to turn to Romans Chapter. By the way, I, I didn't get started right away, so I'm, I think I have a few minutes still on the clock. I was kind of waiting. They asked me to give them a few minutes to get something set up back there, so I was trying to let them do that. Um, so that's my excuse. You've heard a lot of excuses. I wasn't, not that I was rambling. That certainly didn't happen. Um, Romans 5, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? From wrath through him. We have promises throughout the word of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, now, um, chapter 1, verse 10. I'm just going to cover a couple other passages and then we'll finish. You're probably looking at me like I looked at the preachers thinking... There's something I need to go do. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from heaven, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So we have many passages that tell us that over and over uh, in the word of God. Uh, in Thessalonians, first, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. And we'll finish. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul says, Now we, brethren, verse 1, beseech you, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. And as we've heard already, uh, Brother Rick mentioned it last night, uh, this coming is not to be confused with the second coming. Okay, there are several verses. Uh, 
Hold your place here. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are you not even in the presence of our Lord at his coming? So this is when we're in the presence of the Lord as members of the church, the body of Christ, that is the rapture, the catching away of the church, the body of Christ. Amen. Um, Amen. Chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So is there references in the word of God to a coming of the Lord that's for the church, uh, the kingdom church? There are, right? So we don't confuse those two comings. Paul is trying to comfort the Thessalonians, one of the first letters written to the church, the body of Christ, by saying, I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, the rapture, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ being the events, the day of the Lord, tribulation period. Um, so we have great cause in the word of God not to be confused Whenever we hear someone confusing, trying to confuse the issue, preaching the word of God, but not rightly dividing it. And we have a ministry to help others. Um, the verse, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We know what's coming. The dispensation of grace, part, part of the reason it's called the dispensation of grace is God is offering the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will simply reach out and take it by faith. Accept that gift, unwrap it, and, and realize it, appreciate it, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. And so in this dispensation of grace, the whole world is given long suffering according to 2 Peter chapter three. Long suffering and an opportunity for salvation during this time of grace. But these events of the wrath of God coming down, they're going to happen to this world as soon as we're taken out. We have a ministry to warn others, and to establish them, help them to have the security and confidence that they're not going to go through these terrible times when uh, the day of the, uh, um, the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time when we can uh, look together at your word and for the great uh, cause for assurance and comfort that no signs should trouble us that people point to as, as the end of this dispensation or the the coming of uh, the, your coming in the great and terrible day of the Lord, but that you've given us great assurance and, com and, and reason to believe that you've saved us from the wrath to come. And we thank, thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I guess that means the Lord's not coming Saturday, right? <laughs> so the moon's going to have to turn red and without him. It's important to understand the issue of the pre-tribulation rapture. A lot of folks have abandoned that, even in so-called dispensational circles. If you know